The history of electroculture is rich in inventions, knowledge, mysteries, and adventures. Having gone from being utilized in various profound ways by our distant ancestors, to 17th century commercial implications, to complete censorship in many countries, electroculture is quite an interesting topic. Some countries have even made laws against promoting electroculture in the past. In others, they have done everything to make it forgotten, even removing the word completely from the dictionary. Electroculture is the study of utilizing atmospheric energy from the earth and unified fields to help cultivate fertility, vitality, growth, and development in plants, animals, and humans. This electricity can be sourced through natural or man-made means. It is best to work with natural sources of magnetic and electric energy whenever possible. The root word of cultivate means to honor, to love. Basic materials such as copper, magnets, and crystals are some natural elements that can be used in electroculture to cultivate life, love, and source energy, revitalizing our bodies as well as the soil, plants, and wildlife in our gardens. Electroculture techniques offer a potential to increase plant yield and fertility by 100-300%, to 300%, essentially eliminating the need for pesticides or fertilizers, which helps us honor the delicate balance of nature. The term electroculture is synonymous with magnetoculture. Both are generic terms used to describe an assortment of techniques described to amplify and focus magnetic and natural electric forces of nature. Magnetic and electrical forces always manifest conjointly in nature. Magnetoculture, however, refers more specifically to magnetic influences, while electroculture to electric influences on plant growth and soil fertility. Electroculture and magnetoculture are based on the synthesis of discoveries in the field of agriculture encompassing cosmic and telluric energies, electricity, and magnetism. Plants and people are sensitive to electricity and magnetism. Improved plant growth, quality, and increased yields are a few of the noticeable beneficial effects in plants. The technology can also be used to protect plants from pests and diseases. Electric and magnetic effects on people are very similar, as demonstrated by the dedicated work and research of Georges Lakovsky with copper coil oscillators in the 1920s. Lakovsky believed that each of our cells was a minute resonant circuit, and when these circuits were oscillating correctly, we or any living thing were considered healthy. When an outside source causes our cells to oscillate at a different rate, then disease sets in. In his book, The Secret of Life, originally published in French in 1925, Lakovsky wrote, What is life? It is the dynamic equilibrium of all cells, the harmony of multiple radiations which react upon one another. What is disease? It is the oscillatory disequilibrium of cells, originating from eternal causes. It is, more especially, the struggle between microbic radiation and cellular radiation. Lakovsky believed it was these radiations that kept our bodies oscillating correctly, but too much of distorted radiation would cause them to oscillate incorrectly. Setting out to prove his theories, Lakovsky felt that he could generate a practical application to enable the adversely affected cells to regain their full vitality by reinstating their proper oscillatory rate through a dielectric element such as copper. What Lakovsky discovered was truly amazing. He discovered that using copper coils protected our cells from various forms of disease through an ability to generate a healthy electromagnetic field for our cells to continue oscillating at their resonant frequency. Georges Lakovsky's research where he demonstrated the comparison of a living cell with that of an electronic circuit of an antenna inspired him to devise a theory of a living cell as an electronic circuit of high frequencies and electrical oscillations. This led him to publish his first book, The Secret of Life, originally published in French as La Secret de la Vie, Paris, Gauthier Villars, in 1929, 
His focus turned then to the development of electromagnetic systems that can heal plants. Lakovsky coils are little antennas made of copper, oriented in a certain way with north at around 32 degrees, in alignment with the tilt of the Earth's rotation. These antennas can be used for individual plants or trees to heal them from disease or to help them grow. What Lakovsky discovered was simply amazing. He postulated that all living cells, people, plants, bacteria, parasites, etc., hold certain attributes which are generally associated with electricity. These attributes include resistance, capacitance, and inductance. When configured properly, sustained by a small, steady supply of outside energy at the right frequency, these three electrical properties will cause recurrent generation, or oscillation of high-frequency sine waves. This process is commonly known as resonance. Perhaps it could be simplified comparing it with a child swinging on a playground swing. As long as a parent or guardian pushes the swing a little bit at just the right moment, i.e. the correct frequency, the child will continue to swing. In the field of electronics, circuits that generate recurrent sine waves are referred to as electromagnetic resonators, or more commonly referred to as oscillators. Not only did Lakovsky accurately express that all living cells produce and radiate oscillations of very high frequencies, but also that living cells receive and respond to oscillations from outside sources. This outside source of radiation or oscillations generally originate from cosmic rays which embrace the Earth. This amazing realization achieved during our golden years of radio led to a new method of healing by the utilization of high frequency sine waves as well as broadened support and appreciation for the emerging new field of science known as radionics or radiesthesia. When these outside sources of oscillations are in resonance and sympathy, meaning they are the same frequency produced by the cell, the vitality of that cell will be reinforced and become stronger. If, however, these outside frequencies are of a slightly different frequency, they may inhibit or deteriorate that cell's walls rather than reinforce the cell's native oscillations, resulting in a loss of strength and vitality for that cell. The cells of disease causing organisms within an infected person produce different frequencies than those of healthy organisms. Lakovsky found that if he increased the amplitude, but not the frequency of the oscillations of healthy cells, this increase would overwhelm and overshadow the oscillations produced by the disease causing cells thus triggering the demise of the disease-causing cells trying to inhabit the body of people or plants suffering from disease. If he boosted the amplitude of the disease-causing cells, their oscillations would gain an upper hand and cause the plant or person to lose strength and or become ill. Lakovsky viewed the progression of disease as essentially a clash between the resonant oscillation frequencies of host cells versus the oscillations emanating from pathogenic disease-causing organisms. We can apply the concepts of Lakowski ourselves. The basics of his work is very, very simple and easy to replicate. Something very easy and practical that many people can do is wear copper wire bracelets, necklaces, body jewelry, or belts, all made with copper. We can also spiral copper around the base of our plants, as well as around wooden stick antennas in our gardens and potted plants. Copper spirals coiled around sticks from fallen branches of trees works really well. Copper number 10 is a recommended width, however, you can use other gauges as well such as number 8, number 12, or number 14, for example. Taking his cue from his geranium experiments, Lakovsky also fashioned loops of copper wire that could be worn around the waist, neck, elbows, wrists, knees, or ankles of people or animals, and found that given enough time, much relief of painful symptoms were obtained. These simple coils, worn continuously around certain parts of the body, would invigorate the strength of the human cells and increase the immune response, which in turn took care of the offending pathogens. At the time, when new spread of the success achieved with these Lakovsky coils, many Europeans were clamoring to get their own and often had to wait for months due to the backlog.
If you're interested, you can make your own Lakovsky coils or obtain them ready-made from various artists. One of the main reasons why so many people find copper wrist bracelets effective and beneficial is because the bracelet is functioning as a Lakovsky coil. It's also providing minute trace amounts of copper to the body, which helps too. To achieve the Lakovsky effect, it's important that the coil or bracelet is open and made of copper. Closed rings simply don't work as well. Victor Schelberger, the Bearded Water Wizard The forest always beckoned to me. I would close my eyes and open my mind to water. It would then disclose its secrets to me. Inspiring words by Austrian scientist and engineer Victor Schoberger. Victor Schoberger was a student of nature and more specifically of the water element. He was gifted with the patient skills of observation and an appreciation of the outdoors. His fascination with mountain streams and how water worked within the environment led to many innovations and inventions which relate to flow control and the science of water. He realized that water flow was similar to air flow, just a different density, which led to his lift turbines and craft. Schoberger was one of the first scientists to realize that water has many dimensions and structure. Water has surface tension and boundary layer mechanisms, which were revolutionary before 1900. Of course, Nikola Tesla also realized this around the same period. In 1891, Tesla invented the Tesla coil, an induction coil widely used in radio technology. In Colorado Springs, Colorado, where he was staying from May 1899 until early 1900, Tesla made what he regarded as his most important discovery, terrestrial stationary waves. By this discovery, Tesla proved that Earth could be used as a conductor and tuned to resonate at certain electrical frequency. Though unlikely the two ever met, something tells me if Tesla had the chance to meet Schoberger, they would have been great friends. According to an article written by Principa Scientific, Victor was often called the Nikola Tesla of water, as his intuitive research into the science of water profoundly parallels the work and wisdom of Nikola Tesla. Many of Schoberger's early inventions were focused around the transport of timber and then sorting them by use of water flow dynamics and displacement. Back then, transporting timber from the mountains was not without challenges, as this was well before helicopter lifts, trucks, and aerial cable lift lines. Although he worked as an engineer after the success of his wooden stream design utilizing the flow of water to enhance transportation of timber, it is said that Schoberger resembled more of a Shinto monk or an elder shaman, regarding his perceptions of nature as a spiritual entity and an ally. Victor Schoberger, 1885 to 1958, submitted many patents throughout his life. In 1933, he published his first book, Unseer Sin Los Arbeit, or Our Senseless Toil, The Cause of the World Crisis, subtitled Growth Through Transformation, Not Destruction of the Atom. Around this time, he creates the Trout Turbine, one of Schoberger's most notable inventions which utilized the natural vortex motion of water to generate power. The trout turbine was designed to mimic the motion of water in a natural stream, using a spiral channel to create a vortex that would spin a turbine. Unlike traditional turbines, which used straight channels to force water through them, the trout turbine worked in harmony with the natural flow of water, reducing turbulence and minimizing energy loss. The trout turbine was highly efficient and environmentally friendly, making it a popular choice for small-scale hydroelectric power generation. According to his son Walter, most of Victor's time was focused on the development of an ecological, self-propelling, home-based generator of electricity made from spiral pipes. Energy would be created by whirlpools of water and air. Victor had intended for this to be his life's achievement, a cheap and widely available private power plant that harnesses the Earth's natural atmospheric energy without polluting the environment. The Austrian dreamer devoted his last years to this project, which drew the attention of Texan investors who invited Victor and Walter to the U.S. towards the end of 1950s to discuss potential collaboration. 
However, they failed to sign the contract, and Schoberger returned home, feeling like he was being deceived. All of his inventions, including a dozen or so patents, as such for water and wind turbines, were designed to serve not only the people, but also the environment. Schoberger became a prime example of ecologically conscious technology, borrowing its foundations from medicine. First, do no harm. However, in a period between two wars, his forward-thinking nature-minded approach must have seemed backwards to their current way of life, when he made a call to limit the felling of forests, explaining that this disturbs the circulation of water in the ecosystem, increasing the risk of torrential rains and flooding, as well as causing droughts and agricultural crises, sadly his ideas were laughed at. In 1935, Victor Schoberger submitted a patent for a soil cultivation device, the Golden Plow. His Golden Plow demonstrated an inherent efficiency and proven ability to benefit the improvement of crop yield. The term refers to blades made of rust-proof copper rather than iron, designed in a shape which is aligned to the Golden Ratio, or Fibonacci Spiral. The Golden Plow was designed to loosen soil without disturbing soil layers and microorganisms. By copying the mole, he designed a plow that pulls the soil inward rather than pushing it outward. Along with other copper-based agricultural machinery, his invention was recognized only decades later and is now broadly used on ecological farms. What he found was that crop yields increase after replacing iron shovels with copper ones. The vegetables grow bigger and better, while flowers are more resistant to plant laos and other pests. After exploring the subject further, it was discovered that the use of copper plows imitate the soil regenerating habits of moles digging their network of tunnels through a farmer's field. While this technology currently attracts quite some attention on social media, it is still not available on the market. Schoberger's guiding principle for experimentation was his intuition, which was based on his own observations of nature, his reading of old philosophers and poets, as well as on the deep knowledge of the mountain men who had spent their lives in the forests. As the story of Schoberger has shown, technological breakthroughs are often the result of holistic thinking that incorporates ideas from different disciplines and people, including artists, philosophers, farmers, foresters, and engineers. Electroculture, Justin Christoflow, 1921. In the 1920s, Justin Christoflow invented a system of electroculture which proved so efficient that it increased crops considerably, up to 200%, without any chemical fertilizer or supplement. It also prevented disease and helped rejuvenate plants, and among other advantages, the germination of seeds was better and shorter, and crops grew at an accelerated rate. Furthermore, electroculture proved especially suitable in drought-stricken regions due to the polarity and magnetism of land and water. Justin Christoflow took time to explain in his 1921 book, Electroculture, on how his system worked and how to create it, complete with drawings and pictures. Around this time, other countries including the U.S. and England were a bit more resistant to the concept. The U.S. Department of Agriculture issued a bulletin in 1926 which concluded that a review of literature of electrocultural experimentation up to the present time does not lend assurance of great progress. Ten years later in 1936, the British Electrocultural Committee wound up concluding that there was little advantage to continue the work, either on economic or scientific grounds and regret that after so exhaustive of a study of this matter, the practical results should be so disappointing. These committees clearly either had not heard of Justin Christoflow, or perhaps maybe they opposed regenerative electroculture research to preserve their own self-interests, i.e. investments in the agrochemical industry. Electroculture was, however, making its way across France, where Justin Christoflow an engineer and inventor who through widespread implementation of electroculture techniques improved plant growth, rejuvenated old plants, and dealt with many pests and diseases without any use of chemical fertilizers, essentially making fertilizers obsolete. Christoflow experimented in his own potager électrique, or electric vegetable garden, using what he called electromagnetic terocelestial power. His inventions were well reported in gardening literature and even national press. 
Christoflo traveled all over the world lecturing and eventually writing it all in his book, Electroculture in 1921, which was thankfully translated into English. By 1930, Justin Christoflo had implemented thousands of hectares of electroculture farms and gardens in his colonies all over France with his electromagnetic fertilizer and antennas for agriculture. He described his invention as the electromagnetic fertilizer and guaranteed a 20 to 100 percent increase in plant crop yields. More than that, Justin Christoflo patented several devices which went into commercial production, and despite being persecuted for his inventions by lobbyists from the agrochemical sector, over 150,000 of them were sold before war broke out in 1939, closing the factory. Government agencies and the agrochemical industry did not appreciate his inventions because they went against their interests, which were to promote chemical fertilizers. After Christoflo's passing on July 6, 1938, most of his work was temporarily lost until recent efforts of dedicated researchers such as Yannick Van Dorn and the Gardens Trust. Thanks to dedicated researchers in the field, Justin Christoflo still commands a lot of interest to this day, and although he died in 1938, the man even has his own Facebook account, managed by a group of dedicated Christoflo curators, electroculture enthusiasts. If you're interested in the enlightening topic of electroculture, we highly recommend following the Justin Christoflo Facebook page. Christoflo's 1921 book on the subject of electroculture is an almost impossible to find book on the inventor and his incredible work. Here we see in the photo next to his book, Christoflo exposing a plant of an exceptional size cultivated with these methods. He sold thousands of these electromagnetic fertilizing devices around the world in the 1920s and 30s before falling victim to smear campaigns and his death in 1939, which put an end to the development of electroculture in the period between two wars. Justin Christoflo and his wife pictured 1920s with their cabbage grown with the help of electroculture antennas. It is claimed for the system described in this book that by its aid, no backyard is too small, no soil too poor, to grow vegetables in such quantity and of such quality as will materially lessen a family's food bill. Justin Christoflo in the introduction of his book, Electroculture 1921. After nine years of persistent experiments in the use of electricity and quick growing methods, A. Carr Bennett developed a method which proved successful in the stimulating of fertile vegetable seed. It also increases the speed of germination and the number of plants that come to maturity and accelerates maturation. For example, white turnips reached maturity in just 35 days instead of ordinarily about 60 days, which allowed a new production. The Bennett method is one out of many various techniques of electroculture which almost disappeared after World War II, when agrochemicals started to replace everything, with all the dramatic consequences we know today. Some other words of A. Carr Bennett. In 1918, electrified seed of this description gave on an average of over 30%, increased yield in bushels per acre, the grain produced was of a better quality, and the straw l longer and stouter. This is the largest sphere which the writer is now contemplating. Imagine how much such an increase in wheat yield would mean to New South Wales. Let us replace New South Wales with planet Earth, and we can begin to understand how important this book truly is, not only to the well-being of all mankind, but to all forms of life on Earth. Having gone from being utilized in various profound ways by our distant ancestors, to 17th century commercial implications, to complete censorship in many countries, electroculture is quite an interesting topic. Some countries have even made laws against promoting electroculture in the past. In others, they have done everything to make it forgotten, even removing the word completely from the dictionary. Despite heavy resistance, the history of electroculture remains rich in inventions, knowledge, mysteries, and adventures. In the year 1897, the electroculture device called Electrovegetometer was used by Brother Paulin, former director of the Bovis School of Agriculture, a French institution of international renown, one of the most recognized schools in France and abroad. 
The electrovegetometer used in electroculture is an antenna mounted on a pole and connected to iron wires buried in the ground around the pole. A dozen of these antennas arranged in a field of one hectare was enough to fertilize the field. At first glance, this detailed photo appears to show four well-dressed citizens in a greenhouse tending to some potted plants, a scene which might seem fairly ordinary for the time. However, when we look closely at the rest of the engraving, things start to become more intriguing, beginning with the title. Yes, the title really says, A Machine for Perpetual Electrified Garden. So now, Let's take a close look at the rest of the print and see if we can work out what's going on in the picture. After a moment of amazement, eventually we realize that we are in fact looking at a serious scientific proposal on electroculture. The Wellcome Foundation of Science Museum have copies of the engraving in their online collections, however they have no further information. Thankfully, the Gardens Trust Dedicated researchers and avid preservers of the precious gardening techniques of our ancestors were able to track down its first appearance to the July 1755 issue of the General Magazine of Arts and Sciences, Philosophical, Biological, Mathematical, and Mechanical, originally edited and published by Benjamin Martin. Here's a detail of the print showing Martin's machine. In the center, you can see the upright tube or body of the machine, 8, 10, or 12 feet in height, and at its base, the horizontal trunk, through which the water spouts from holes at each end, but on contrary sides. At the top are two glass globes, which are turned by the machine by means of a cord, and so rub against two cushions, pressed in place for greater or lesser degrees of friction. Projecting out from the frame are two iron rods suspended on silk ropes which act as the conductors to the wooden frame on which the garden sits. Notice that the legs of the frame sit on blocks made of resin or wax which act as insulators. Martin suggests in this garden may be placed in pots any sorts of plants, flowers, etc., which when machine is in motion may be constantly electrified. One globe is enough to be in motion at a time, and when that is too hot, the other may be put into motion, and so they may be alternatively used night and day without cessation of the electrical effluvia on the plants. In order to create a perpetual electrification of animal and vegetable bodies, we here propose a machine, which we think will be sufficient for an experiment of this kind. It is the application of the hydraulic machine invented many years by Dr. Barker, with a proper apparatus for perpetually electrifying the plants and fruit trees of an artificial garden. There are many references to Dr. Barker and his device, sometimes known as Barker's Mill, because it was later adapted to grind corn, suggest it is a 17th century invention. Although this might be possible, indeed Martin suggests it was invented many years ago it's more likely to have been devised or certainly substantially improved by Robert Barker, a member of the Royal Society in 1743. It's powered by water which flows into a rotating vehicle tube and is then discharged through nozzles at the end of two horizontal arms at the base in a similar way to a modern rotary lawn sprinkler. The power generated is taken off by a belt around the tube. He finishes his article by saying, as a constant stream of water may in most places be had, and as the expense of such a machine and garden would not be very great, it is much to be wished that those who have it easily in their power would oblige mankind with some attempt of this nature, that they might be satisfied what could be effected in medicine or physics by perpetual electrification. Benjamin Martin was an impressive character a self-educated man, someone who accomplished many things in his life, such as becoming a teacher, writing a large dictionary, and later traveled the country giving lectures on natural philosophy. He also created scientific instruments and had even written an essay on electricity, being an inquiry into the nature, cause, and properties thereof in 1746. The print was accompanied by a brief article quoted here. 
as it is our professed design to improve every discovery for the public good as far as we are able, and as electricity is now well known to be somewhat more than of a mere curiosity, inasmuch as it has been successfully applied to the cure of several disorders of the rheumatic and paralytic kind, and to remove obstructions and pains occasioned thereby. Benjamin Martin, 1746, an essay on electricity being an inquiry into the nature, cause, and principles thereof. Surprisingly, for a topic many people have never heard of, there's quite a long list of inventors and a diverse collection of lost, forgotten, electroculture technologies. Here we have a timeline highlighting the major contributors to the field of electroculture, which I created to the best of my knowledge, for the preservation of this important research. Many of these contributors are mentioned in this video. You're welcome to pause the video as needed to read through each page. So how is it that electroculture was a curiosity then, when the 18th century essentially didn't have it? It was in the year 1600 William Gilbert published the book De Magnet, a thorough investigative analysis on electricity and magnetism. William Gilbert was inspired by the Greek word for amber, electron, Latinizing the word into electricus, which rapidly assimilated into the vocabulary of those interested in natural philosophy and early science. The words electric, electrical, and electricity followed shortly after. The phenomenon of electricity has been known since antiquity, with references to amber crystals, crystallized tree sap, creating static electricity around 600 to 500 BC. This was through Thales, of Melitus, Ionia, one of the seven wise men of Greece, founder of the Ionic philosophy and from whose school came Socrates, is said to have been the first to observe the electricity developed by friction in amber. But references go back even further. Some examples fostered by dedicated researchers include the Baghdad battery, which is potentially the world's oldest acid-based battery dated to around 3,000 years old, the Dendera plasma bulb, hieroglyphs dated to over around 4,000 years old at the Hathor Temple in Abu Sir. The conductive Great Pyramids of Giza, potentially over 12,000 years old, pre-flood structures. This school of thought was spearheaded in recent years by researchers such as John Anthony West in his 1979 book, Serpent in the Sky, Engineer Chris Dunn, author of the Giza Power Plant, developed further by James Brown, author of Fire in the Middle, and renowned author researchers J.J. and Desiree Hertak. The 108 conductive Shiva Lingams of Angkor Wat, examples of electromagnetic conduction from thousands of years ago, brilliantly explained by Praveen Mohan.
There are actually many references to a diverse collection of electric antiquitech from a lost advanced age. If you'd like to learn more about the breadcrumbs of advanced technologies left behind by lost civilizations, stay tuned for my upcoming video titled Lost Age of Advanced Healing Technology. The history of electric culture is rich in inventions, knowledge, mysteries, and adventures. Having gone from being utilized in various profound ways by our distant ancestors to 17th century commercial implications, to complete censorship in many countries, electroculture is quite an interesting topic. Some countries have even made laws against promoting electroculture in the past, in others they have done everything to make it forgotten, even removing the word completely from the dictionary. The founding fathers of electroculture are not alone in their valiant mission of sustainable cultivation of healthy food and environment. Their collective contributions to the field continue to inspire many on their journey to health and well-being guiding us to align with the regenerative ways of being and living in harmony with Mother Nature. Over a century later, we feel truly lucky to be able to present this precious information to others, including farmers, gardeners, agronomists, researchers, students, and anyone concerned about food, health, and the environment. Are you ready to learn electroculture for yourself? It takes genuine courage to embrace change for the greater good. Thank you for being here. Thank you for learning about electroculture. Your actions today are helping to plant the seeds for the cultivation of humanity's growth, leading us to embrace and contribute to change in a positive way for all life on earth to benefit. If you'd like to learn these techniques for yourself, we highly recommend checking out the diverse collection of references in this video. Additionally, you can view the sources at the end of the video, connecting with those which resonate the most with you in your unique journey. With respect for the individual perspective, please take what resonates and leave the rest. And if you're wondering, why are our farms and fields not yet full of these amazing apparatuses, which lead to increased crop yield, better nutritional content, improved resistance to disease and pests, all accomplished using sustainable, eco-friendly bioactive materials without the need for fertilizers? We invite you to read more information on electroculture and the censorship which has resisted the growth, development, expansion, and research in the field, and a plethora of information, practical methods for electroculture on Yannick Van Dorn's website, electroculturevandoren.com. Electroculturevandoren.com is a wonderful resource for techniques, examples, results, and observations that allow us to consider the unique options of agricultural techniques that are most resourceful for us. Join the news on electroculture on the dedicated page on Facebook where Yannick regularly shares news and testimonials. And if you enjoy reading and are interested in learning more on electroculture from the original literature that's been preserved on this fascinating subject, we recommend checking out this collection of books in the re-edition by Talma Studios. With electroculture techniques, you can cultivate greater abundance for you, your family, and community, helping to improve your overall health and well-being, bringing you closer to nature, while also helping you establish independence from the system, which guides us towards a more sustainable future for all. How can we contribute to the mission to help bring electroculture back to life? You can choose to work with electroculture techniques in your own garden, sharing your experience and helping to teach others about the benefits of regenerative, eco-friendly gardening techniques. Additionally, if you are a student, you can choose electroculture as your capstone subject, thesis, or research topic, thus participating in removing ignorance to this important topic at the foundational level. It's not the easiest path, for it is a path much less traveled, one that is potentially much more motivating, however, to know you are contributing catalyst to cultivating health, harmony and happiness for all life on earth. If you feel called to contribute further to the mission of educating others on the wonderful applications of electroculture, 
Yannick Van Dorn has partnered with Electroculture.life to provide an opportunity for us to co-create a documentary about electroculture. If you'd like to contribute to help this wonderful film reach the greater community so that all life on Earth can benefit from this amazing information, you're welcome to visit indiegogo.com slash projects slash electroculture dash life dash the dash documentary. Please join us in experimenting and feel free to share your results, which can help to ignite this beautiful spark for someone else. I genuinely appreciate you taking the time to adventure through this video, stopping by to smell the roses, and to hopefully receive some information which may help you to cultivate energy from the unified field as a sustainable source of health, harmony, and happiness for you and for all life.